Bueno, buenos días de nuevo. Vamos a iniciar esta, esta mesa redonda. Eh, me acompaña un panel tremendo dentro del mundo de la certificación profesional internacional. Eh, voy a ir presentándolos, no ahora todos de golpe, sino según vayan interviniendo, para que vayáis quedando con quién es cada, cada uno. Eh, como veis por los carteles y de las eh, banderitas que aparecen, eh, tenemos una representación internacional muy, muy, amplia, muy amplia. Por tanto, creo que es una, un día histórico en ese sentido y una oportunidad. Cada vez vivimos más en un mundo global que exige de una movilidad profesional y la sociedad necesita distinguir a los mejores, como ya hemos dicho antes. Los títulos académicos solo son un requisito, como hemos hablado también, pero no es suficiente para ejercer la profesión y ejercerla de la mejor manera. Hoy tenemos una gran oportunidad de conocer y entender qué es lo que está pasando a este respecto en nuestro entorno. Y por ello ya vamos a pasar a… voy a empezar a presentar a cada uno de los ponentes, como decía, en el orden de intervención. Eh, tienen cada uno 15 minutos, espero que se acojan a ello, porque si no andaremos apretados con la hora. Eh, y vamos a empezar por eh, presentar a Katy Turf. Katy es la máxima responsable de los estándares profesionales del Engineering Council. Eh, Katy asume la operación para el mantenimiento y mejora del UCA estándar relativo a las competencias profesionales de los ingenieros, la UCA SPEC. Los estándares para la acreditación de la formación de ingenieros y el registro de prácticas del Engineering Council. También es responsable de la supervisión estratégica de asuntos internacionales del Council, incluyendo la membresía en el Eurace. Los acuerdos de educación e ingeniería internacional e implementación de directivas de la Unión Europea sobre reconocimiento de cualificaciones o profesionales. Preside el Foro Internacional del Grupo Interprofesional del Reino Unido, Profesiones Profesionales Juntos. Ha representado al Consil como ponente en reuniones de la Comisión Europea, FEANI, ENAE y EIA y en conferencias y seminarios en el Reino Unido para el reconocimiento de las cualificaciones profesionales. Es una persona cualificada para contarnos mucho hoy y representa una institución digamos, de mucho, mucho prestigio en el mundo de la certificación profesional. Katy, cuando quieras. Uh, good morning and uh, a pleasure to be here in such a beautiful city. Thank you for your invitation. I'm going to tell you a little uh, about who we are at the Engineering Council and uh, the regulatory system in the UK and how engineers self-regulate. Uh, sorry, this is <laughs> not... We we'll just get the. <laughs> uh, if we can just. Uh, good. Thank you. So. Our role as the Engineering Council is to be the regulatory body for the profession in the UK. Uh, we set and maintain internationally recognised standards of professional competence for people on our registers. We have over 222,000 registrants worldwide at present, of whom around 18% are working outside the UK. There are many different associations of engineers in the UK, and some of these actually have their own charters and titles. The first of these is the Institution of Civil Engineers, which was established in 1818, so celebrating their 200th anniversary next year. And they also had the first chartered title in around 1922. So we've been awarding uh, these types of titles for a long time. But the Engineering Council itself didn't come into existence until 1965, when <coughs> it was felt that all of these bodies needed to have um, a, a mechanism to establish a common standard and ensure that a chartered engineer is a chartered engineer, whichever um, of the institutions and disciplines they've come through. But those bodies remain autonomous. We don't tell them what to do, but we work with them, and they essentially, through our board, actually set the standards um, and make sure that, uh, that we keep everybody in line uh, in the UK. So the Engineering Council is actually set up by a royal charter, and that gives us our authority um, to work within the UK, and it gives us some delegated authorities by government. We're also a registered charity, and 
it's important to notice that our role is to work in the interests of the public, so for the public benefit. We are not there to benefit <coughs> engineers or employers, but to make sure that the public is protected through the appropriate um, education and training of engineers to ensure that they meet uh, valid standards. We've got a lot of different definitions of what a profession is in the UK. Uh, this is just one of them. But again, an important aspect of this is that a professional will be somebody who's using an established body of knowledge, they're providing a specialised service, they're exercising professional judgement, and most importantly, they comply with a code of ethics. They have signed up um, to work in a professional manner. This is important in terms of our regulatory framework in the UK because we don't have any statutory requirements or reserves of activities uh, for engineers. The government legislates in the public interest. Uh, consumers uh, can take recourse to civil or criminal law. The professional bodies set the standards of competence and professional conduct. We have a British Standards Institute which sets uh, technical standards and increasingly standards around service-related elements, including uh, uh, competences. And then individuals have responsibility for maintaining their own uh, professional competence and indeed for signing up um, and committing to professional codes of conduct uh, through joining our register. So our legal system actually places the responsibility on the employer or the client to make sure that they are employing competent people. And one of the ways they can do that is to recruit people who are registered professionals and who have made that commitment um, and demonstrated that they have the necessary qualities. Our system is one of voluntary self-regulation. So self-regulation occurs when the professional body and the government agree um, that that form of regulation will actually be by the members of the association and not through a statutory requirement. And in the UK, that traditionally takes the, the form of a royal title, uh, sorry, royal charter and um, protection of professional titles. And therefore, we have the titles of, of chartered engineer and so on, which are protected, even though the term engineer and engineering are not themselves protected. And strangely, in our society, where we, we struggle sometimes to encourage enough young people to take engineering degrees, uh, there are lots of people who love to call themselves engineers. So we, we see all sorts of job titles called engineer. But the protected titles are the ones which tell you whether that person actually has been assessed as meeting a professional standard. So in terms of professional registration, this is about recognition that the individual's competence and commitment have been assessed, that they've demonstrated that they've actually met um, a standard to an appropriate level. And again, in the UK system, something that's very important to us is that this is open to competent practicing engineers and <coughs> technicians from all sorts of different uh, levels and pathways. So we don't prescribe the way they reach competence. Um, they, they can reach that um, in numerous different ways. Um, and we like to make sure that the system is open to anybody who can demonstrate the level of competence uh, that we require. So we register at three different levels. Uh, the first of these is engineering technician. And they are very much uh, the people who are applying proven uh, techniques and procedures and who really keep the wheels of industry turning. Uh, I don't think there's a direct equation in the system um, that AQPE has set up uh, for, for the engineering technician. Um, I think the professional engineer um, classification that you have is probably more aligned to incorporated engineers and these are the, those who are um, maintaining systems, uh, managing uh, processes, they may have some involvement uh, in design and development. And then our third categorization would be the senior engineers and indeed expert engineers um, and the title we use is chartered engineer uh, and they are very much the people who are leading um, the, 
the development of new technology, uh, the new forms of application for existing technologies. They're the ones who solve problems from fundamental principles if, uh, if there's no clear solution, and they have technical accountability. So we think of them very much in terms of, of different levels of responsibility and professional judgment um, that the person may be applying. In terms of actually setting the standard, um, our standard is known as UK SPEC, the UK Standard for Professional Engineering Competence. And the bodies that set that standard are our professional engineering institutions working through us, the Engineering Council. So it's very much a collaborative exercise. Uh, we, we review the standards at least every five years. We're actually about to start the next review probably in about 12 months' time. Uh, we like to consult as widely as possible because it's important that these standards are meaningful for society, for employers, for government, as well as for engineers and those who educate and train them. And in our next consultation, we hope that we will um, get that uh, invitation to comment out much more widely because we would welcome comments from our international partners. Uh, it's important, again, that our standard stands up to international requirements and how the engineering field is developing internationally. These days, industry is so globalized, so many of our engineers work overseas, whether or not they, they live outside the UK, um, I, just as an aside, I was at a dinner recently and around the table of 12 people, every single one of them had worked in at least one other country for a period of time in the last 12 months. It, it's a very global um, profession these days. So that international recognition is, is important and maintaining um, the international um, relevance of the standard is really important. Competence for us combines knowledge, skills, and abilities, and it can be gained through formal, informal, and non-formal learning. So it's very important to have access um, whichever routes people are coming through. To qualify, it's essential to actually have applied engineering experience. So somebody needs to have really practiced their profession in the workplace. Our professional engineering institutions tend to have a discipline focus. The majority will be called something like the Institution of Civil Engineers or the Institution of Chemical Engineers. So that gives you a clue to their focus. And they will take the standard and tailor it for their specific discipline so that it's relevant um, for people working in their field. But the aim with UK Spec is to provide that generic benchmark that can be used um, wherever uh, it's being applied. Membership of a professional institution is also a, a prerequisite in order to get our protected title. And the reason for this is that as the Engineering Council, we're very much stand setting the standard um, at, the, at the top level, but we don't provide the services that help engineers to keep themselves up to date. It's the professional engineering institutions who have um, the support available for continuing professional development, who do research, who share knowledge, um, who work to, uh, to enable their uh, members to understand requirements around the code of conduct, and who actually enforce um, the disciplinary requirements if somebody infringes that code of conduct. So we're in the luxurious position, if you like, of coordinating it all and then sitting back and saying, right, you get on and do all the work. Consequently, they have a lot more staff than we do. We're quite a small organization. UK SPEC then, as a framework of competence and commitment, is uh, in a sense very similar to the one that we heard uh, described earlier. We, we look at five categories, um, the ones you can see here, so A, A to E, and A is clearly around the knowledge side of things, so for most engineers that will be um, fundamentally what they've learnt in their degree, but we do expect by the point of registration that they will have continued that learning and evolved that learning according to where they've ended up after they've graduated. So we find that five years after graduation, it's very rare that, for example, somebody who graduated with a mechanical engineering degree is doing a job that's called mechanical engineering. 
They may have moved into a, a specialist area, perhaps they're working in the water industry, um, perhaps they're in the nuclear industry. Um, they are probably almost certainly working in an interdisciplinary area where they will be working with other engineers but also professionals from other areas. So they need to demonstrate even under knowledge and understanding that they have expanded their knowledge beyond what they had at university. And then, as you would expect, the application of that knowledge, what they've actually done in their workplace. The responsibility, management and leadership. Um, are they able to actually run a business, run a project and so on? Communication, absolutely critical that engineers can communicate. Uh, if you have found the best product that's going to save the planet and you can't explain that to anybody, then you are not going to get buy into your product and the planet is not going to be saved. You must be able to communicate. If there's a disaster waiting to happen, as a professional engineer, you must be able to communicate. You must be able to convince your employer that it's more important to act in a way that is safe and doesn't cause damage to, to people, to the environment, than perhaps um, to meet their um, profit and loss account um, demands. So you really, um, communication is very, very important for engineers. And of course, all of the interpersonal skills. And then professional commitment, and I'll come on a little more to that. So competence is the ability um, to apply knowledge, understanding, skill, um, all of these with a professional attitude. And it's developed, as, as I've mentioned, through combinations of formal and informal learning, training, and experience on the job. Now, we take the view that these are not necessarily separate. It's not necessarily a linear process. So traditionally, you might think about going to university, then doing some training, then doing some experience, and then becoming registered. We take the view that you may do those things in a different order. You may do some learning, <laughs> then come back and do some training, uh, come back into the learning environment, and so on. It's very much an iterative process. And actually, um, learning can be improved by having some experience as you go through. So you can actually take that experience back into your learning, and it helps you to tailor your learning more and make sure that you really understand um, how that will work when it's applied. So um, we're very, very keen to promote, for example, work placements and pre-university um, periods of practice for students to ensure they get that learning. Critically, professional competence goes beyond graduate competence. It's not just about getting a degree, but actually um, what you learn and develop in terms of your skill set beyond that. In terms of commitment, well, clearly, um, complying with codes of conduct is, is important. Um, engineers, when they become registered, they must commit to managing and applying safe systems of work. They must demonstrate how they do that in their practice. They must be aware of sustainability, and again, they're asked to demonstrate how they take that into account in their professional practice. I've mentioned continuing professional development. Again, that's very important for engineers. At the moment, we have a requirement um, that at the point when they become registered, they demonstrate commitment to continuing professional development and a code of conduct obligation to maintain their competence. Uh, but we are just moving to a situation where we will actually be verifying that on a, a periodic basis. So again, a task for the institutions to go back to their members and ask them to submit records of their continuing professional development to make sure that they really are um, keeping those records and, and um, reflecting on things they've learned and taking that back into their practice. We encourage active participation in the profession. We're a profession that relies on the voluntary effort of the registrants and of the members, but also it is a profession that works on the basis of peer review. So it's not for an administrator to determine whether somebody is a professional engineer. It needs another professional engineer to be able to assess that competence. And so um, we, we expect people to commit to putting something back into the profession and of course to applying their professional responsibilities in an ethical manner. I'm going to run through this quite quickly in the interests of time and not go into quite so much detail as, as I might have done, but I think um, it, 
it's probably covered in, in other presentations as well. So in terms of the routes into registration, the, the sort of uh, traditional route is uh, along the top line would be to undertake some form of education base, so normally um, an engineering degree. For chartered engineers, that would be at master's level. Then to take some form of training, to have a period of experience. Now, typically, that might be achieved within about four years post-graduation. In practice, a lot of engineers will wait, wait a lot longer before they come forward for professional registration. Either they're not confident or they just haven't had the opportunity to develop the full range of competence. So what we see is that it's usually about 10 years post-graduation that engineers seek registration. The, the sort of spike in our numbers is around the age of 33, 34. If they're going through a, a less traditional route, then follow the bottom line. Um, they may have a period of work-based or experiential learning. They may have combinations of formal learning and experiential learning. Um, that learning will be assessed before we look at the, the trading and experience side and look at the competence in the totality. Everyone, regardless of how they've come through the system, when they apply for registration, their competence will be assessed. And that's through, first of all, by submitting a dossier of evidence, which would be um, go through a desk audit. So two um, professional engineers will review uh, their dossier. And if they're satisfied that there's a good case, they will invite that person then to have a professional review interview. And that's, a, again, a peer review interview where normally two, sometimes more, engineers will sit down with that person and really explore <coughs> what they've done, what they understand about what they're doing, and make sure that they are really understanding and demonstrating professional competence and their commitment um, to the profession if they are successful. So really, uh, moving into the final part of this presentation, in terms of the benefits um, in our system, as we see them, the competence of professionals is key to assuring the public um, that engineers can and do act in a safe manner that's in their interests. It's about assuring that the profession has the knowledge and expertise um, to set and assess standards of competence and knowing that it's the profession that, that's carrying out that activity. It's the profession that accredits degree programs and sets standards for engineering education. The protected titles themselves are restricted to those who actually have demonstrated that they meet, meet required levels of competence and commitment. And that admission to that actually does reply, uh, rely on professional expertise and the peer review process. The fact that the system is voluntary demonstrates that it's really a personal commitment. People are becoming registered because they see the need um, to demonstrate and to really undertake that personal commitment, not because they're told legally in order to do this job, you must be registered and they're just doing it because you know, it, it's a requirement in order to practice. It's because they actually believe that it's important to behave in a professional manner. It assures the public that um, by remaining registered, they are required to maintain their competence and therefore the fact that they registered some years ago does not mean that uh, their competence has gone out of date. They are required to keep that up to date. And that because um, engineer and engineering are so widely used, uh, the protected titles help people to know when that person really is um, a professional engineer. Finally then, the benefits and the importance are to society in terms of assuring and safeguarding um, their well-being, to employers in knowing that they are recruiting people who are both technically and uh, professionally competent and who are maintaining their competence, but also that if they need to move those people around, there is a mechanism through which they can be recognized, both within the European Union and also more widely through the international standards and through delegated authorities that we have uh, under European legislation. And it provides the individuals 
um, with the internationally recognised and respected approach to becoming registered, confirmation that their peers in the profession recognise them as professionals, and the opportunity to exchange and enhance their knowledge through communities of practice and interest uh, within their professional institutions. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Katy. Eh, como habéis visto y podido comprobar, el Engineering Council tiene mucha experiencia, una gran, larga trayectoria. Katy nos la ha contado. Y, y me quedo con dos cosas que ha dicho. Una, que, que, la verdad, de forma ambiciosa. Una, la autorregulación, cómo la plantean y cómo la tienen establecida. Y otra cosa que ha dicho, que es que dice que ellos están abiertos a todo aquel que pueda demostrar que tiene sus las competencias. Gracias, Katy. A continuación, eh, presento a Joan Barceló. Joan Barceló es presidente de ISACA eh, Barcelona, ha desarrollado toda su carrera profesional en Caixa Cataluña por más de 31 años en las áreas de sistemas de información, terminales financieros, cajeros automáticos, etcétera, en temas de cumplimiento de normativa, prevención de blanqueo de dinero, la LOPD. Tiene la certificación CISA del 2002 y la CISM de 2004 por ISACA Internacional. Participa activamente en su junta en la Junta Directiva del Capítulo de Barcelona de ISACA desde 2004. Ha sido secretario segundo y director de auditoría y actualmente, desde junio de 2016, ocupa el cargo de presidente. Además, es perito judicial en informática y tecnología, siendo miembro de la Asociación Catalana de Peritos Judiciales Tecnológicos. Joan, cuando quieras. Voy saludando a Mendras. Muchas gracias. Buen día a todos. En primer lugar, agradecer a CUP y a IP que me hayan convidado a participar en este esdeveniment. El mes de octubre y noviembre voy a tener la primera trobada amb, amb a CUP. Vamos a trobar puntos de coincidencia inmediatos que perseguimos cosas muy semblantes y bueno, nos hemos brindado enseguida a participar en esto, cosa que agradezco. Ya, ahora ya tenemos, tenemos la presentación. Ya, el que haré es comenzar para explicar una miqueta si los mitjans ens... funciona. A ver si... No vaya. Entonces, explicar una miqueta qué es ISACA y, y después entraremos en materia en lo que son las certificaciones. ISACA va a a los Estados Unidos en 1969. Uh, va a ser una, una trobada entre empresas que eran competencia, porque eran diferentes consultores, las grandes consultores que había en América en los años 70, en los años 69. No? Y precisamente las va a juntar la competencia para crear competencia. Cosa que tenía que aprender porque creo que es muy chulo. ¿no? Es van juntar empresas que entre sí doncs, eran rivales, pero van buscar tindre més buenas competencias para hacerse más fuerte y para crecer. Entonces, va a ser fruto de esta unión que enseguida va a entrar la primera certificación, que después la hablaré más extensamente, que es la de Auditor de Sistemas de Información, y paralelamente va a entrar lo que serían las mejores prácticas para el oficio, que en aquel momento era puramente auditoría, que va a comenzar el, el COVID, que es objetivos de control relativos a las tecnologías de la información. A mayores, eh, por tener caminar, borra 50 años, de aquí a años que hay 50 años, o sea, que ya tenemos una miqueta de profundidad histórica. El, la, la, el funcionamiento de ISACA es en voluntariat, eh, son gente que son entusiastas de transmitir el conocimiento que tenim y aquí porque hay mucha coincidencia amb los miembros de esta tabla. Porque justamente es lo que tenemos, es transmitir el conocimiento para hacer una sociedad, intentar hacerla una miqueta más segura. Pretenemos ser fondo de confianza en el conocimiento y desde la seva creación hemos publicado y compartido white papers, libros, artículos, jornadas de formación arreu del mundo. ISACA ha esdevingut entidad de referencia para la calidad de sus certificaciones. Permeteu que hagamos de una miqueta, pero amb los años que portem, doncs, estem estamos muy bien reconeguts a todo arreu. N'estic coneixent d'altres que no conocía y que, que, que celebro conocerlas. No? Es un aparador fantástico aquest que he organizado aquí. Del material que distribuimos y tanto para sus asociados, para nuestros asociados, que hay una área del soci, que evidentemente los que pagan nos tienen un, un, una primicia de todas las publicaciones que tenemos y después hay una área de uso global on tothom pot gaudir del coneixement que estem difonent. Amb el curs del temps hem anat incorporant la seguretat, el govern i el risc que veurem en detall més endavant. La estructura arreu del món es compon per capítols. Uh, actualment tenim 215 capítols, o sigui que som, som una associació gran. Barcelona és el capítol 171, va néixer el 2001, Estem repartit en 92 països de tots els sis continents. 
I en quant a membres associats, ara tenim aproximadament 140.000 a tot el món i que estan en 187 països. Jo crec que estem pràcticament a tot arreu. Aquí tenim un detall, aquesta com me la van passar, no sabia si posar-la o no, però vaig trobar que era molt representatiu i com que parlem de certificats i de certificacions, em penso que també us pot servir a tots plegats per veure com hem evolucionat nosaltres. Com que va néixer als Estats Units, evidentment, és allà on tenim més gent associada, tenim un 48%. Els americans, que són molt seus, per cert, m'han posat la bandera americana i sóc català, però això és un petit detall. Els americans, que són molt seus, posen Europa i Àfrica junta, amb un 26% d'associats. Europa, vaig estar mirant ahir el detall, per curiositat, Europa és el 21% i Àfrica el 5%. I és molt representatiu que Àfrica té el 5% dels associats. Si mirem amb aquesta gràfica, tenim aquí Amèrica Llatina un 4%, que sé que està creixent perquè tinc molts amics de Sud-amèrica que per la llengua tenim afinitats, i a Oceania un 3%, i Àfrica s'està posant les piles de veritat. I quan vaig rascar una miqueta més, per veure com anava això, a la part d'Europa inclou Rússia, que tenim 316 membres, i a Turquia, que en tenim 514, que m'ha sorprès gratament, i a la part aquesta d'Àfrica tenim en tercer lloc del rànquing que ocupa a la part d'Europa, amb 2.155 associats, Sud-àfrica. I vaig estar fa uns anys a Ciutat del Cap i em sorprèn que tinguem tants associats, o sigui que allà hi ha coneixement i hi ha ganes de fer moltes coses. El sisè lloc l'ocupa Kenya, amb 1.166. El novè, Lagos de Nigèria, amb 1.023, que també no deixa de sorprendre. I el darrer, tancant per la cua dels 61 capítols que conforma Europa i Àfrica, tenim a Port de Nigèria, no està malament, o sigui, s'estan posant les piles per tot arreu i això es pot ser un bon missatge per tots plegats. En quant a la nostra missió, com no pot ser d'una altra manera, és proporcionar coneixement en forma de certificacions i el material associat. Oferint recolzament a empreses, universitats, administracions, òrgans judicials i l'advocacia en l'àmbit de les TIC. Concretament, a Isaac a Barcelona donem recolzament a l'administració pública catalana fa poc, ahir precisament vaig estar a l'Institut de Seguretat Pública de Catalunya on farem una col·laboració en ciberseguretat per als seus comandaments intermitjos. Amb el CECICAT fa dos anys vam estar fent un curs de formació d'una de les nostres certificacions, el CISM. Col·laborem amb l'Il·lustre Col·legi d'Advocats de Barcelona on periòdicament, cada dos o tres mesos, fem unes pindes tecnològiques on portem tecnologia amb els advocats que estan interessats per les tecnologies de la informació i que jo entenc que ens faran falta tots plegats. Estem evolucionant d'una manera tecnològica molt ràpida, però necessitem gent que ens sàpiga defendre i ens sàpiga ajudar, i ens pugui ajudar, més que sàpiga que ho necessitem que ens ajudin. I com avui, col·laborem i participem en diferents desorganitzacions afins, comuns, que tenim nombrosos convenis per unir esforços, per tots plegats intentar fer una societat més segura. I ara ja entrem en detall amb el que són les certificacions. Aquestes són les quatre certificacions que tenim nosaltres, la nostra qualitat, i que aquí en Cati ja ha apuntat alguna cosa i abans en Francesc quasi m'aixafa la presentació, perquè tenim moltes coses en comú, per tindre una d'aquestes certificacions tens que superar un examen. Els exàmens són durillos, s'aproven un 75%, però jo entenc que tots els exàmens són durs, perquè tenim que assegurar que hi hagi nivell. Una vegada has aprovat l'examen, tens l'examen aprovat. Tens que demostrar i acreditar 5 anys d'experiència professional que això també ho heu parlat fa una estona, no? I no només això, amb això ja tens un diploma, t'arriba un diploma a casa que diu senyor Joan Barceló, vostè té CISA, té CISM, però no n'hi ha prou amb això, no el pots posar al calaix. Tens que demostrar una permanent actualització, una formació continuada, i cada tres anys tens que acreditar que has fet 120 hores de formació, que això et dona 40 hores de promig, tens un mínim de 20 hores anuals, perquè no pots tirar la Bartola un any i després recuperar-lo de cop, i el que t'obliga a estar permanentment actualitzat. I com aconseguim aquestes hores nosaltres? Doncs des d'Issac a Barcelona organitzem unes jornades de formació continuada mensuals que venen a donar unes dues hores. Fem dos congressos a l'any, a la primavera en fem un conjuntament amb ITSMF, o sigui, col·laborem amb altres associacions, a l'octubre fem el nostre, i si algú ve totes les jornades que fem, incloses les de l'ICAP, o van amb jornades com la que organitzeu vosaltres i altres moltes jornades interessants, perquè a Barcelona som afortunats que tenim un munt d'esdeveniments molt interessants per l'ofici i per la professió, doncs s'aconsegueixen aquestes hores. Els certificats són a títol personal, no a títol d'empresa. Hi ha moltes empreses que ens porten els seus empleats perquè s'acreditin, 
però si se'n van se'n porten l'acreditació aquesta, perquè és a títol personal. I ara, si us sembla, ja us anirem al detall, el primer que va aparèixer va ser el de CISA, que és auditor de sistemes d'informació certificat, i aquí llegiré la part institucional perquè no m'he pogut aprendre a memòria. En l'entorn empresarial de ritme ràpid i cada vegada més complex d'avui, la informació s'ha convertit en la moneda més valuosa per les empreses de tot el globus. Professionals de sistemes d'informació juguen un paper vital en la mobilització del valor i asseguretat la seguretat, això és la confidencialitat, i la integritat dels grans volums d'informació que impulsen els negocis. Per aquells professionals i les empreses, la certificació CISA és reconeguda com a prova de competència i experiència en oferir garanties que els actius crítics de negoci estan assegurats i disponibles. En els seus pilars, com s'ha dit, està auditar la integritat, la confidencialitat i la disponibilitat. Al món són més de 129.000 persones certificades vigents. El principal lloc que ocupen és el de director d'auditoria, director i llocs amb auditories, en l'àmbit de la consultoria, i a Catalunya dona punts en determinades licitacions amb l'administració pública i amb alguns és indispensable. Això ens va conèixer, però això és el que aspirem tots, que tenim una certificació, que ens la posin en valor, que ens la reconeixin i, a més, que la demanin per poder fer determinats treballs. A continuació tenim el de certificat en gestió de la seguretat de la informació, el CISM. Aquest és el segon que va aparèixer. En un món on l'èxit de l'empresa depèn cada vegada més dels sistemes d'informació i la tecnologia de la informació, la confiança dels clients, empleats i altres parts interessades d'una empresa pot dissipar-se ràpidament en patir un incident de seguretat de dades. A mesura que el creixement nombre d'incompliments del perfil demostra les fallades de seguretat d'informació, pot resultar un dany significatiu al compte dels resultats, així com la seva reputació. I això hem tingut una mostra evidenta fa un parell de setmanes amb l'atac de ransomware que va assolar tot el món. La cadena de Renault de França va tindre que aturar, de l'edifici de Telefònica de Barcelona els hi van fer parar les màquines i que sortís la gent ordenadament. O sigui, va crear un petit caos, un gran pànic. La repercussió social ha sigut molt gran, han atacat a tot arreu i hem d'estar preparats. Per garantir una major alineació entre els programes de seguretat d'informació de les organitzacions i les seves metes i objectius més amplis, cada vegada més empreses, governs i agències esperen i fins i tot exigeixen que els seus professionals de la seguretat de la informació tinguin un certificat CISM. Actualment, com mostra la diapositiva, són més de 32.000 persones certificades al món. La seva sortida principal és la de directors i administradors de seguretat i el món de la seguretat lògica amb el seu més gran espectre, que ha fet des de Montvigno, de la seguretat lògica. El següent que tenim, que és el CGIT, el CGIT és un que és el de govern de les empreses de tecnologies d'informació certificat. A mesura que la tecnologia s'ha tornat més i més vital per a l'assoliment dels objectius de negoci i el lliurament de valor, els dies de les empreses s'han adonat que governar l'empresa ha de ser estès a la tecnologia i als sistemes d'informació. Les empreses d'èxit accepten que és important alinear els projectes de tecnologies de la informació processos actius amb el seu negoci, estratègies i objectius de negoci, com un component clau de la gestió general de l'empresa. El govern de TI s'ha convertit en un assumpte de missió crítica per als negocis petits i grans a les empreses de tot el món. Per tal de donar suport a la creixent demanda de les empreses i de promoure les bones pràctiques de govern de les tecnologies d'informació, ISACA va crear la primera i única designació... És el que hi ha per reconèixer l'habilitat dels professionals del govern de TI, que és el CGIT. Com es veu, no té tanta tirada perquè tenim 7.000 persones certificades vers els 120 i escaig mil que teníem del CISA, però aquesta és la més ben valorada i la més ben remunerada dels professionals que tenen aquesta certificació i exerceixen això. La darrera certificació que tenim és la del RISC, el CERRIS, Certificat de Sistemes d'Informació de Riscos i Control, en l'entorn empresarial actual, les empreses necessiten innovar per sobreviure i florir. La innovació, però, gairebé sempre implica un risc. Per mantenir o assolir la seva competitivitat, els líders d'empreses amb visió de futur estan reconeixent cada vegada més la necessitat per als professionals que entenen la tecnologia i, en concret, la forma d'aplicar i alinear la gestió 
eficaç dels riscos i els marcs de control amb els objectius de negoci de la seva empresa. Per ajudar a satisfer la creixent demanda de professionals amb aquesta barreja crítica de tècnica i comprensió de negoci, ISACA ha reunit els seus experts industrials de tot el món per desenvolupar el que s'han convertit en la designació estàndard per la gestió del risc, que és el fer risc aquest. Aquesta és la darrera certificació creada i té forta acceptació. Portem 20.000 certificats, està creixent, està en franca pujada i el trobem sobretot els que tenen aquesta certificació en posicions executives. Aquestes són les quatre certificacions que tenim. Ara, permeteu-me, que em sembla que vagi bé de temps, costillo, però aviat, no? Com no pot ser d'una altra manera, també hem entrat en el món de la ciberseguretat, amb el programa Cyber Security Nexus. Des de Barcelona, fa poc hem fet amb molt d'èxit el primer curs del Fundamentals, Pretén ser una carrera de ciberseguretat, on hi ha la part de Fundamentals i després hi ha la Practitioner, que té diferents laboratoris on es fa el 50% de teòrica i de pràctica. No és una certificació, això és un certificat, això és, fas el curs, la proves, tens nota i el pots guardar al calaix, o sigui, no t'exigeix la resta, però cada vegada s'està demanant a més empreses que es disposi d'aquest certificat per poder accedir a llocs de responsabilitat. Intentem ser un referent amb el sector. Ja veurem si ho aconseguim, no? I per acabar, parlar una miqueta del Covid. Des de la creació d'ISACA es va fer un marc de referència d'objectius de control per les empreses o guia de les millors pràctiques, dirigida al control i supervisió de les tecnologies de la informació. Inclou un resum executiu, un framework, objectius de control, mapes d'auditoria, eines per la seva implantació i una guia tècniques de gestió. Objectius de control per les tecnologies, d'aquí ve el Covid, va néixer la versió 0, la versió 1, va anar incorporant coses i ara anem per la versió 5, que ho tenim pràcticament, no, sense el pràcticament, ho tenim tot cobert. I amb això us dono les gràcies pel vostre temps i quedo a la vostra disposició per les preguntes que pugueu fer. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies, Joan, primer per haver-te tenit el temps. Perfecto. Ho he intentat, eh? Y me quedo con, de tu presentación me quedo con dos cosas que has dicho que me han llamado la atención. Bueno, me llamado la atención. Una, tienes un, habéis tenido, tenéis un camino ya desarrollado del que tenemos que aprender los que estamos empezando en él y bueno, hoy tenéis ya gente certificada en los cinco continentes. Eh, bueno, esto lo que nos... Bueno, los seis. Esto nos ratifica en el que esto es una necesidad global, no es una cosa de, de moda, sino que es algo necesario y global. Y has dicho una cosa que es que dice que para vosotros la certificación habéis conseguido que sea una moneda valiosa para las empresas. Yo creo que hay una parte de clave que está ahí. Entonces, enhorabuena. Yo creo que es, es, es el objetivo principal. Muy bien, continuamos. Eh, ¿Me vas dando esto por mientras voy poniendo la presentación? Bueno, ahora eh, va a participar Daniel Sander. Daniel Sander, eh, desde 2011, es director general de la Cámara de Ingenieros de Baden-Württemberg, en Alemania. Eh, Daniel fue portavoz de dos políticos en el estado de Baden-Württemberg, Alemania, desde el año 97 a 2006, fecha en la que se pasó, pasó a ser el director de la oficina parlamentaria de Bernard Sattle, miembro del Parlamento del Estado de Baden-Württemberg hasta 2011. En 2009 fue candidato de la CDU para el Bundestag en Friburgo. Es miembro de la Junta de la Hochschule Kostan Technik, Wirtschaft und Gustaltun, miembro del Consejo Asesor Empresarial de la Hochschule für Technik de Stuttgart, responsable de la Comisión de Educación de la Cámara Federal de Ingenieros y desde 2015 es además miembro de la Junta del Centro Alemán para el Desarrollo Académico en Beirut. Daniel, cuando quieras. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation on behalf of the Chamber of Engineers of the Federal State of Baden-Württemberg. Our chamber represents all engineers in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. Baden-Württemberg is one of the four motor regions for Europe. All of them are represented at the round table today. It's a, it is an, an economically strong and export-oriented region with a growing demand for engineers, it's especially actually in the areas of electoral engineering, civil engineering, and IT. Due to the demographic factors, there are not enough qualified people 
in Germany to meet current demands. It means that Germany, and in the particular Baden-Württemberg, depends on the influx of foreign engineers. The Chamber of Engineers of Baden-Württemberg is therefore very act act uh, active in efforts to find engineers from abroad. For, for a year now, we have also been responsible for checking and recognizing the qualification of foreign engineers in our federal state. To keep things as short as possible, I would first like to show you a short film about our chamber. I will then explain the professional recognition system for engineers in our state. I have also brought along some statistic relevant to recognition from the last year. Finally, I will say a few words about the producement of engineers. Let us begin with the film. Stuttgart's television tower is a monument to German engineering skills. Such masterpieces, however, are long in the making. Every vision begins with an idea, which grows gradually in a process of teamwork. We at the Baden-Württemberg Chamber of Engineers engage with politicians and the public to create the conditions in which visions become reality. We begin with education and training. For school children and students, we organize competitions and educational programs. This acquaints them with the practical side of the profession. Given the great demand for skilled staff, we also help employers to find highly qualified engineers from abroad. Our partnerships with universities and other institutions make this possible. We set up connections with other countries to enable entry into foreign markets. Our members can then take part in large international projects. Our contacts with consulting engineers that we have personally audited for competence enables us to help clients find the best independent professionals. Exactly the right expert for any planning or structural engineering task can be found in our lists of engineering specialists. Our multifaceted network includes expert committees, conferences, and courses of instruction. It enables our members to share ideas and undergo further training. In this respect, public sector engineers are an important interface between local government and planning offices. We award the internationally renowned Fritz Leonard Prize to outstanding structural engineers. Our benefits and pension plan provides protection and security in the event of retirement, disability, and other occupational risks. Engineers are the builders of civilization. We are always there to help them so that they can concentrate on their most important task, to reshape the world with their outstanding innovations. Baden-Württemberg, Chamber of Engineers. <clears throat> that was a brief overview of the task performed by our chamber. For one year now, our chamber has been responsible for recognizing foreign engineering qualification in our federal state. Previously, four different government agencies did this. The fact that we now have central office in our federal state makes things much easier for foreign engineers. This brings us to the topic how professional recognition works for engineers in Germany. As you know, federalism is taken very seriously in Germany. Our friends from Catalonia will no doubt understand this. What this means is that the 16 federal states in Germany themselves decide how to organize the recognition of professional qualification. When it comes to the standards relating 
to what the qualifications related to. However, they are they all have to adhere to the EU recognition directive. Do foreign engineers have to have their qualification recognized in they want to work in Germany? Not necessary. In Germany, it is permissible to work as an engineer without recognition of, the, of one's foreign qualification. But it is not permissible to call oneself an engineer unless one is actually entitled to do so. The title of engineer is protected by law in Germany. Engineer is defined in the 16 engineering laws of the federal states. Unfortunately, they are not the same in every state. How can foreign engineers find out who is responsible for them in Germany? They can visit the internet website anerkennungindeutschland.de. There is also an English translation for this. Here, it is possible to select specialist areas of qualification and the place where one's main residence is or where one works professionally. In 13 of the 16 federal states, the chambers of engineers are responsible for the recognition of engineering qualifications. In, their, in three federal states, North Rhine-Westphalia, Bavaria, and Hamburg, the regulations are different. The bodies responsible can be found on the above named website in the internet. <clears throat> in a foreign, if a foreign engineer has his main residence in Baden-Württemberg or works here professionally and he wants to have his qualification recognized, he has to get in touch with our chamber. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to check application by person from other federal states in Germany. Our engineering law indicates who is permitted to call himself and himself an engineer in Baden-Württemberg. To call oneself an engineer, the following is necessary. A course of studies must have been completed successfully in a technical or natural science subject with a standard study period of six semesters and at least 180 ACTS points at the state-recognized higher education institution and the contents of the course of studies must be primarily mathematic, information science, natural science, and technology related. If the applicant has an education of foreign origin, our chamber checks whatever whether this qualification match these requirements. Application from the EU countries and EU contracting states profit from so-called facilitated recognition requirements. Unfortunately, however, facilitated does not mean uncomplicated. In summary, this means that particular experience in the relevant profession Lifelong learning or compensatory measures can be cited by applicants as compensation of deficits in professional education and training. If the deficits are too large, EU citizens must be given the opportunity to obtain recognition by means of compensatory measures or an adaptive period of study that must last three years at the most. Of this purpose, the Chamber of Engineers has set up a recognition committee composed of independent experts. Up to now, however, we have not had a single case where the recognition committee has to, had to per prescribe compensatory measures. The recognition process Unusually, usually take three months unless a time cons consuming expert assessment has to be commissioned. This is the case, for example, when the 
Higher Education Institution of the applicant is not listed in our nationwide database. All further formalities, such as information on necessary documents or the fees, are indicated on our homepage. What are the chances of recognition? The recognition rate in Baden-Württemberg has been very high for years, around 96%. Last year, the Chamber of Engineers proceeded just under 500 applications from 47 countries. Only 4% of them had to be rejected. More than a third of the applications came from the EU countries. Most of the applications came from Syria, followed by Romania and the Russian Federation. This is not surprising, given that Germany has accepted many Syrian refugees. For them, the recogni recognition rate is also nearly 100%. What are the specialist fields of the application, ap applicants? Most of the applicants from 2016 had studied mechanical engineering, closely followed by structural engineering and to a somewhat less, lesser extent electrical engineering. In the current year, there has been a very large number of new applications. Each month, we receive around 65. If the situation does not change, the number of applic applicants will almost have doubled in 2017. This means a lot of work for us, but it's good news for Germany. We need these engineers. Our chamber, therefore, offers a free job placement service for foreign engineers who want to have their qualification recognized in our state and who are looking for employment. However, we do not guarantee that we will find them a job or that their qualification will be recognized. That is all from me. For the time being, thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Daniel. También te has ajustado perfectamente al tiempo, así que vamos de enhorabuena. Y me quedo con dos cosas. Una que has dicho en tu presentación, que vuestro objetivo es encontrar a los mejores. Y luego otra cosa que yo ya la conocía, pero que creo que es muy importante que tenéis, que es una ley de ingeniería que protege además quién puede utilizar la palabra ingeniero. Son dos elementos importantes. Bueno, pasamos a la siguiente intervención de Stefano Calzolari, que es el presidente de la Agencia Nacional para la Certificación Voluntaria de la Competencia de los Ingenieros de Italia. Estefano es desde diciembre de 2016 miembro del Consejo de la Junta Nacional de Ingenieros y desde febrero de 2015 presidente de la Agencia Nacional de la Certificación Voluntaria de la Competencia. Desde septiembre de 2011 es miembro del Comité Nacional del Ministerio de Medio Ambiente y Protección de la Tierra y el Mar. En el periodo 2009 a 2016 ha sido presidente de la Orden de Ingenieros de Milán, donde anteriormente fue consejero y presidente de los comités para la actualización y formación profesional y para la certificación de calidad. De 1999 a 2002 fue presidente de Formación y Desarrollo Profesional en la Orden de Ingenieros de Milán. Ha sido igualmente consultor de CTA, Junta de Técnicos Especializados en Construcciones de Acero, presidente del CEN, TC344, Sistema de Almacenamiento Estático de Acero y miembro del Consejo de la European Ranking Federación. Estefano, adelante cuando quieras. Thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, first of all, I would like uh, to say buongiorno from uh, Italy, from uh, on behalf of the Italian National Council of Engineers. I really feel honored to be here, and uh, I consider this meeting really very important. Uh, and for this reason, I am not here alone. There are other two Italians, Mr. Uh, uh, Roberto Orvieto, who is uh, engineer and conseiller of CNI, and uh, the person responsible for the international relationship. 
and uh, uh, later we'll uh, uh, speak with you uh, Ruggero Lenzi, engineer and the general director of UNI. Therefore, the Italian speech, let me say, is divided in three parts. I hope short part. But okay, we can, uh, we can start uh, uh, with uh, my own presentation. Um, I think there is uh, immediately a short uh, video spot. Uh, this video spot, uh, unfortunately, is in Italian. But I know that uh, Spanish people are always able to understand Italian and uh, at the end it's not so important to understand each word but to grasp the meaning of uh, uh, the movie. So uh, we can... No, this is not... Uh, uh, I, I have to... We need the technicians. And, Il Consiglio Nazionale degli Ingegneri ha istituito l'Agenzia Nazionale per la Certificazione Volontaria delle Competenze degli Ingegneri. Si chiama Agenzia Cert Inge, una nuova realtà che si occupa di valorizzare le competenze acquisite da tutti gli ingegneri iscritti agli ordini. Un processo di rafforzamento di tutte le competenze presenti sul territorio attraverso una valorizzazione del concetto di lavoro, conoscenza, professionalità, capitale umano. La domanda di partecipazione al progetto CERT Inge è volontaria e aperta a tutti gli iscritti agli ordini. E attraverso la certificazione sarà possibile acquisire 15 crediti formativi. Certificare significa mettere in primo piano la tua esperienza, il tuo sapere, le tue idee, la tua capacità di innovare. Questa è l'identità del progetto CERT Inge. Vali per ciò che sai. Vali per ciò che fai. Okay, I hope you have understood, but uh, uh, the meaning of this uh, process, of this uh, program, is uh, to enhance the profession of engineers. We need uh, to give additional value. We need uh, to raise the importance of our profession in the society. And this also because in the last uh, years, you know, there is uh, a kind of uh, underestimation of what the engineers are. And this is one of the main reasons why the uh, agency Certing uh, was born. Uh, I think that uh, it is very important to underline that this certification is under the control of the order of engineers because uh, they are not simple association. They are important institution of the state and they are protected against uh, the influences of uh, politics and the influences of uh, commercial interest. They are independent. They can manage this important subject from a cultural point of view. The whole process will be validated ISO 17024, and this is uh, common with uh, other experience uh, that we have uh, uh, seen during this meeting. But uh, what is competence? This is very important. Competence is uh, the combination between uh, the first line university degree plus continuous professional education and experience and skills acquired on the field between inverted commas. That means uh, nobody can trust an engineer who has only theory. Nobody can trust an engineer who doesn't study and has only practice. We need always the combination of the two. 
But very often, very often, all our attention is put on the first line of this slide, diplomas and degrees, where the main matter of the discussion between the European organization. Now we want to speak of, we want to speak of competences, and the competences, uh, practical performances of the engineers, uh, in my opinion, are important in order to establish the principle of uh, a mutual recognition in Europe. Uh, let me make an example. If we have to compare two cars, we cannot compare only the engines. Of course, the engines is important. Uh, the power of, a, of the engine is the first thing I have to, to understand, to see, to, to know. But it's also important the chassis and the skills of the pilot, the skills of the driver. So this is what uh, I want to focus about competences, the combination of the two. And for this reason, we have uh, established two levels of uh, Certing uh, uh, diplomas. Not three, as uh, is shown in the other examples, but uh, I think the level two can be considered uh, a sort of uh, combination of uh, uh, the second and the third uh, class uh, in the other schemes. Level one is especially suitable for young engineers, but not only. In this case, uh, uh, it is not important to be absolutely autonomous. Uh, the responsibility can be shared. On the level two, on the contrary, you need a personal aptitude to take personal responsibility. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, the years needed to have uh, the first or the second level are different. But uh, in, the, in the second case especially, it's important to have an adequate curriculum vitae. You have to demonstrate that uh, the specialization you are looking for is really a specialization of, of your working life. These are the tasks of uh, the Certing Agency. There is no time for my part of the speech uh, to explain everything, but uh, uh, I want to, to tell you that we are at the beginning of this national process of certification, and in this period the agency is doing especially a tutoring, tutoring activity. This is uh, the current situation of the certification in Italy. We have uh, 240,000 engineers enrolled in order of engineers, and we have uh, 106 order of engineers. For the moment, this is uh, the distribution of uh, the certi certification centers uh, in Italy, but we are going to complete, I hope, uh, <coughs> the distribution uh, within the end of, uh, by the end of this year. And uh, uh, probably we will have uh, thousands of certified engineers starting from uh, uh, 2018. This is the flow diagram of uh, the process that is uh, very similar to the process, to the process uh, shown uh, briefly by Cathy Tarf. Uh, you see that uh, uh, there is uh, a peer review interview for the level two, which is uh, compulsory in order, in order to understand if uh, the candidate is really trustable or not when he asks for a specialization. And uh, how long uh, lasts this certification? The certification uh, is valid for three years and after these uh, first three years, uh, there is uh, a repetition of uh, the peer review and a repetition of uh, the contact between the candidate, the engineer, and uh, uh, his uh, order of engineer. Now I show you two certificates. Uh, I don't know if you can read from uh, distant, but uh, uh, it is just an example. <coughs> uh, they are both for the second level. 
The first is uh, in the sector industrial, the uh, department is electrotechnic and the specialization is uh, the design of electrical plants and uh, internal distribution. The second one refers to the sector uh, civil and env environmental. The uh, department, the sub-department is uh, uh, quite strange but very common now because this engineer works for the court. He's a consultant of the judge. So Ingegneria Forense is the Italian name. And uh, the specialization is about uh, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, evaluation dealing with uh, residential buildings and so on. The third one is just an example, is in the sector of uh, IT, information technology. And uh, this engineer want, want to emphasize his capability to uh, be uh, expert in uh, uh, managing ISO 9001 and other quality systems. <clears throat> so as you can see, this uh, certification can apply to a, a lot of sectors, to all activities and possible roles of <coughs> engineers. And uh, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, common uh, situations with the other schemes uh, I have seen during this uh, very interesting morning. And uh, on the basis of a comparison between schemes, we can find a way to recognize uh, our engineers uh, around Europe. This is my, my hope, and uh, I hope to have other occasion to, to promote uh, uh, this certification activity for our members. Thank you very much again. I think now there is this, the second part.
define technical specification in the same light of UK as, as provided in industry, and also help um, engineer in the process of certification. You know that ISO 17024 is a standard which is published as our system. So we have defined this standard for certification of personnel. So what I can say that the collaboration between, between the standard body and the association of professions and with the engineer has been strong. It's a very good example in Italy, and maybe it can be also a good example in, in Europe. At the end, a very last example, we have provided with the audit of Milano a specific um, standard how to develop uh, the ethic of professional. It's a very interesting experience that we have uh, made Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Estefano. Me quedo de tu presentación con dos cosas que has comentado. En el vídeo acababa con una, un mensaje que es «Vales por lo que sabes, vales por lo que haces». Creo que es fundamental eso en el mundo que estamos eh, definiendo en estos momentos. Y también con una definición que has hecho de competencia como que es el título académico más la formación profesional continua más la experiencia y las habilidades». Eh, gracias, Estefano. Thank you. Now we have Roberto Orvieto for two minutes. Ah, ah ok. Okay. Thank you.
Bueno, continuamos. Ya nos hemos comido todo el tiempo de nuestra mesa, así que, francés, lo siento, te voy a robar un poquito más. Eh, presento a continuación a Thierry Rousse, vicepresidente nacional y presidente de la región de Medio Pirineo de la Sociedad Nacional de Ingenieros Profesionales de Francia. Eh, del año 79 al 82 fue jefe de Supply Chain Management en la industria mecánica y del acero en Francia. Fue ingeniero jefe como cargo de teniente coronel durante el 82 a 2002 en el Ministerio de Defensa de Francia, en el French C4E System Expert. Y de 2002 a 2012 es el CEO en la empresa Pulsar Innovation de Aerospace Valley en Toulouse, Francia y Estados Unidos. Thierry, adelante. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. I'm very happy to be in Barcelona with my friends Francesc and Tony. And my, present my presentation is a presentation of French certification system. The certification system of SNEPF is one and only engineer certification in France. No one. There's a big problem with this. The roadmap of the association is very, uh, the history is very important in France. It's a very old country with a very young president. And it's very important. SNEPF uh, has been has created in 1936, uh, 56? No, 36. 36. And after the Second World, the, the first meeting of certification committee in 1947. In 1982, uh, SNPF is a member of EOSF. EOSF is a community of engineers and scientists in France. EOSF recognizes personal, um, professional engineers like uh, real engineer. It's very important in France. Real engineer, recognize engineer, like graduate in a school of engineer. In 1991, during the World War, the first agreement between SNEPF and British SPE. It's the first step for SNEPF to have an access in English spoken market. It's very important for a French engineer. In 1997, uh, accreditation by COFRAC. COFRAC is a French committee of accreditation. It's uh, very important to have this accreditation to, be, uh, to have an uh, organization of certification for engineers. Last year, celebrating the uh, 18th anniversary. Who managed the SNEPF Association? A president uh, in Normandy. It's a very hard job. It's a Viking man. And um, next year, uh, probably it's me. But I am in Toulouse. It's more easy. So, the certification committee is in Toulouse. The headquarters is in Normandy. And the association is in Marseille. It's very easy to manage. Uh, and a president in Normandy and a board with uh, uh, 22 administrators in Paris. A good feeling and a good pleasure. <coughs> Who certifies the engineer in France? A national certification of uh, organization with SNEPF. Two organizations, National Certification Commission in Toulouse. Seven meetings per year for 19 folders, 19 dossiers by commission. It's very important. To, uh, free college to decide unanimously, unanimously. A college of employers, a college of graduate engineers and scientists in France, a real engineer in France, and professional engineer, the same. The, the three colleges are unanimously. To, to certify engineer. And the uh, second organization is who decide, steering committee in French committee direction. One or two steering committee per year. 
composed by Max Marty. Max Marty is the chairman of this steering committee. Max Marty is a very old president of university, of Polytechnic. It's very important. He, he signed uh, the, the certificate. Me and uh, Jean-Claude Gaillard, uh, the president of the committee. Quali uh, also quality manager. Quality manager is very important uh, for COFRAC, for French uh, Committee of uh, Accreditation. 49 specialties recognized uh, in the ISO country. In reference of ELO classification, it's more easy to, to understand uh, with a specialty of engineer. For international comparison also with American evaluation. Uh, now we have 49. The next year, uh, 15. I don't know. Uh, I deliver a certificate of competence of professional engineer. In one specialty, several are possible. May have free certification in organization, in information security, and cyber security. It's possible in France to have several certification for one person. For three years, renewable. If you are not uh, renewable, yeah, it's top certification. It's very important for Cofrac. Uh, 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 last last year, every year, control audit by Cofrac to see uh, the operation. Typical situation in France to become certified engineer. First of all, graduate engineer who change specialty. Uh, for example, a mechanical engineer and uh, the evolution of career is uh, in uh, IT services. 45% uh, of uh, professional engineer certified is a graduate engineer of uh, school uh, of engineer in France. Second uh, typical situation is scientist, master, PhD or doctor of science. Uh, it's very important in, uh, uh, I say in, in, in Spanish, uh, empresa, uh, in company, uh, to, to have an uh, engineer for the tax. For the, it's very important. If you have no uh, engineer, you have, uh, you have big tax. And uh, also non-graduate non senior, non-graduate with many, many uh, experience. How to certify? Uh, I see the different uh, process of certification. For France, in engineer for f four years, engineer skills certified by employees, or two clients, if a liberal uh, engineer. Being senior, being expert in its function, have a bachelor level training with additional trainings like the same Italian and United Kingdom. And uh, very important for engineers, submit a descriptive function of engineer. The, fr the French engineer have a, a big job to uh, Defined to explain how he is uh, in function of engineer. 40, 15 page in the folder. It's a hard job for the candidate. And present a reconstruction of the career, so it's very easy. So the most important in the, is uh, the folder of descriptive function of engineer in different company. French certified engineer, why? Why French engineer have need certification? For French engineer to access international project. Is, uh, they, they, they know that the French uh, in, uh, school of engineer in France are the best for us, but 
don't, don't know <laughs> in USA and United Kingdom. Uh, it's necessary to us to have a, an international s certification. To perform abroad, have many contacts with uh, Africa, we have many contacts with Asia, we have many contacts in Europe, and uh, now many contacts with uh, United States. Many, uh, a lot of two <laughs> engineers go to the USA, to Boeing, to... Uh, it's very difficult for employers in France to have a French engineer, have a Spanish engineer, have an Italian engineer, have a Moroccan engineer, uh, like doctors, like, uh, but it's very difficult to have the, the best of French engineers in aeronautical space in France. It's important for employers because uh, I say more engineer is more resource tax credit. It's very important for the company. More engineer and more resource tax credit. In France, say crédit impôt recherche. American and USA have many partnership with French company to have this credit and poor research. When you s send a company to, to a US company, uh, some of uh, engineer uh, uh, is in France to have this tax for American company. And uh, also to integrate a new innovative network. Uh, many, many, uh, good partnership with many competitiveness cluster in France. Uh, for example, Aerospace Valley in Toulouse, the, the town of Airbus, and uh, also uh, Derby uh, in Perpignan for the renewable energy with Barcelona and Zaragoza. And uh, Cyan, it's a second uh, industrial uh, Our foreign partner, a partner with uh, a Society of Professional Engineers of United Kingdom, uh, a partnership with ABEI, it's an Italian uh, association, uh, association of British engineers in Italy, but it's Italian, Acuper, Cochiti, uh, California University for the evaluation, um, some of French engineers certified by SNEPF, have PhD from uh, University of California. And also with Global Academy of Finance and Management, it's like the same uh, California academies for management of project, for the big uh, certification in management of project. Thank you. If you have uh, many questions, my ultimate answer is 42. <laughs> Hemos conseguido ganar tres minutillos, <ríe> ya nos queda menos. Bueno, de, de tu presentación me quedo con dos cosas que has mencionado. Una, que una de las razones para la certificación es el acceso a los proyectos internacionales y otra que me llama la atención, que en, en Francia, cuantos más ingenieros, menos impuestos. Ojalá pasara aquí eso también. Es una buena, una buena medida. Gracias. Bueno, ya avanzamos para la última de las ponencias eh, que le corresponde a Micaela, Micaela Dos Ramos, que es la directora ejecutiva de la Real Sociedad de Ingenieros de los Países Bajos, Kiwi. Eh, Micaela lleva, eh, como esta en esta función, perdón, es responsable del desarrollo de la estrategia, las operaciones <coughs> y las relaciones internacionales. También asume la figura de responsable de registro de profesionales de Kiwi para el título de Chartered Engineers y de Incorporated Engineers. Es responsable del desarrollo de procesos de acreditación para la enseñanza de la ingeniería y miembro del Comité Ejecutivo de la FEANI. Antes de unirse a Kiwi, Micaela ha sido directora ejecutiva de NIFER, la institución de investigación de la Universidad de Nine Road, directora ejecutiva de la firma de consultoría Tropenars Hamden Turner y CEO de Holland Gateway, una organización público-privada dirigida a fomentar la investigación y la cooperación internacional. A lo largo de su carrera ha participado en el desarrollo de las competencias de los ingenieros y otros profesionales. Micaela, adelante. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also uh, in general to AQP and AIP for inviting me here um, to this beautiful Barcelona. I was so happy coming in here uh, yesterday. Uh, immediately texted home and said we have to come here this summer together. Um, 
This morning, um, for me, was also a celebration on this topic of professional registration. Um, I think it was really nice to, uh, to see the many commonalities. Uh, I'm really, really very hopeful that um, uh, we can build on this and have uh, a common framework uh, together in Europe. Um, I, uh, in my presentation, I will say uh, first very briefly something about uh, our organization, the Royal Netherlands Society of Engineers, uh, and then move on to um, uh, talking about the professional registration. Um, and I will try to um, also touch on some of, the, some of the angles are the same, just so that we can all see how much we have in common, and then also see if I can um, bring some extra. Um, KIVI, which is the abbreviation of Koninklijke um, Nederlands Vereniging voor uh, uh, Ingenieurs, um, is uh, uh, the professional as association of engineers in the Netherlands. I'm going to do something. If you can excuse me, I'm going to wear my sunglasses. That means my ordinary glasses got broken in traveling, so I have to resort to my sunglasses. They're a little weird, but otherwise I can't see properly. <laughs> Thank you. I tried all morning to do without, but now at least I can apologize. Um, okay, we're, we're this year 170 years old, and we represent all engineering disciplines, um, and we are uh, also very bound on, 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 on sort of creating a common ground between engineers, industry, academia, and government. And uh, we were f um, uh, founded by the king, and that's where in the previous slide you saw um, the previous queen who, who um, was our patron, um, still is actually. Our mission is to be a community of engineers, industry and academia um, to engage in the professional development and the overall development of an engineering profession and with a commitment, a deep commitment to improving our society. Our uh, um, the slogan is also engineer your career and improve our society to have those two aspects. Um, that's why we foster high quality education of engineers and we want to also contribute to the positive image and identity of engineers and uh, to promote knowledge and understanding of engineering. And we offer a platform to engineers to be heard and a think tank for co government and industry. Um, we have a membership of 20,000 uh, engineers from all disciplines, I was saying that before. And we offer a wide range of services uh, and activities to accommodate uh, all members and, um, uh, throughout their career, from, so from student, career starter, mid-career, seniors, uh, and, and also even to retired engineers. Kiwi has over 60 sections, um, of which uh, uh, just a little under 40 are uh, discipline-oriented uh, 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 sections, uh, and 16 are regional sections. Um, we have a uh, young professional section and three student sections, and then uh, eight what we call discussion circles, which are more multidisciplinary as well. Um, and this is just a, a bit of the way that we are uh, organized. Um, uh, within all these various disciplines and our uh, various geographies. And we organize over 500 activities per year. Um, and we, have, we hold also the largest combined online and offline engineering platform, uh, which combines information and jobs and dossiers and all of that together. We have a career development center where we offer coaching um, uh, journal discounts and all th those sort of things. Um, we reward excellence uh, on various prizes um, uh, that we hand out. Um, we hold three academic chairs uh, on the field of big data science, on the field of architecture and health, which is sort of like smart architecture, um, and on the field of uh, dynamic space maintenance. Um, and this is part of our collaboration with, um, uh, between academia, the universities, and the industry. So our chairs are not aimed at students, but our chair are aimed at um, uh, bringing the uh, research from the universities into industry and bringing the industry point of view into the research in the universities. 
Um, we have the Academic Society of Engineering, which is um, a distinguished society within our uh, uh, association of over 500 professors of engineering. Um, we offer um, HR and strategic support for industry, for which I, about which I will say something again later. And we advise and cooperate uh, with the government. Um, our vision and goals for professional registration, and um, that is um, to create a learned society ab around an international quality standard and ensure the development of the engineering profession as a whole. Now, with this, um, we kind of take the uh, professional registration a little bit broader than only register. Um, we find it very important for engineers to um, continuously develop themselves um, uh, uh, after they graduate and even after they have registered to continuously develop themselves again. And we want to um, also include the various other stakeholders in society in this registration. So we, we, we use it almost as a tool in order to um, uplift the engineering profession, which also involves um, uh, the universities, the universities of applied science, um, the higher uh, uh, research centers in the countries, and um, industry itself. Um, they all are collaborating and kind of part of um, uh, actually this professional registration. Um, so through this, we aim to promote and support the recognition of excellent engineers. I mean, first and foremost, of course, uh, it's about uh, uh, setting aside engineers who are uh, uh, up to the task and up to the standard who have qualified. Um, structured, and initial, uh, uh, structured initial and continuous professional development. Uh, we use the term initial professional development just for actually the same thing as continuous professional development, but just before you qualified, and then afterwards we call it continuous professional development, but it's the same thing. Um, mentoring and reflective learning, um, uh, a powerful context for cooperation between industry, academia, and research institutions, like I was just trying to explain before. Um, a broadening of professional skills and uh, uh, ethics, and it is actually also a tool for us for self-regulation, um, as it's also been said uh, on this table before um, uh, this morning. Um, and again, the cooperation with local industry, universities, technical in institutions, and international organizations. Um, we offer two professional titles, uh, the title of Chartered Engineer and the title of Incorporated Engineer. Um, and the title of Chartered Engineer, um, uh, I think it, 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 it's, our system is rooted also very much in the same system as, as the UK. When we started setting it up, we um, worked together very closely with the Engineering Council and we're still uh, very happy uh, in this cooperation. And personally, we are very much indebted to Miss Katie Turf over uh, at the table uh, for all the help that she's been giving us in setting this up. Um, and um, uh, in comparison to uh, what we've seen also this morning, the chartered engineer level would be around uh, uh, with the PE, the, the second and the third level sort of uh, combination. Uh, and we have an incorporated engineer level, uh, which would be um, uh, uh, at, um, uh, it's actually a quite a different prog profile, more the profile of the engineering uh, technologists, which it would have typic typically as a base um, the four-year bachelor program of um, the Universities of Applied Sciences in our country. Um, so our pathways to chartership is uh, for the chartered engineer title, uh, a master's degree or above, um, and uh, a, qualified, uh, a qualifying degree. Um, and uh, uh, we, we ask for five years of minimum of uh, professional experience um, or initial, uh, and, and initial professional development. Um, in general, uh, uh, typically, um, uh, candidates will have uh, uh, 10 to 15 years of experience and sometimes even more. <coughs> uh, 
Um, and like I just said, the uh, incorporated engineer, um, the formal education would be um, typically the four-year bachelor uh, uh, degree of the universities of applied science. And again, the same uh, uh, goes for the uh, minimal years of professional experience and initial professional development of five years. The five competencies, I think we've seen them already several times uh, on the screen, which, like I said before, is for me a reason for joy to see this repetition because it's, it shows that we have so much in common. I think we can be so close to having a common framework that also uh, the, the previous speaker, Roberto, I think was talking about. Um, uh, same, same style here, um, uh, uh, the knowledge and understanding of, of engineering competence A, B, the design and development of process and systems, and together they are focusing really on the engineering knowledge, technical uh, uh, knowledge, and then the leadership, uh, communication, the professional commitment, uh, which focuses on all the other skills that are equally important to have. And oh, I, I have to say also, um, uh, they are outlined in uh, the, what we call the NL spec, uh, which is no coincidence that it looks like the UK spec because uh, uh, we, uh, we also copied it and, and, and then gave it our own name. The assessment uh, and application process is also very similar again to what I've see, heard uh, before here. Uh, uh, we start with a CV f the, uh, uh, a part in, in which uh, a candidate uh, first has to uh, clear that stage to see if he qualifies at all uh, for this process. Then um, build a co portfolio uh, to complete that, which is uh, uh, um, sort of also the desk research that, that we've also been hearing uh, talking about this table, uh, which is being reviewed also by peers. Um, and then uh, there is an interview uh, of two um, very uh, uh, senior and experienced uh, engineers, which is a peer-reviewed interview uh, of an hour and a half, uh, and only afterwards then there may be qualification. Our CPD requirements after uh, qualification is uh, 50 hours of CPD per year, or we uh, stack it in two years periods of 100 hours, which gives a little leeway if, uh, to, 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 to uh, shift that 50 hours uh, um, more or less within those, two hour, within those two years, so you can shift it within a little bit. Um, and we also have some requirements about how many hours you can do about what. So 75% um, uh, of the hours are uh, in those five competencies, uh, and then you have uh, 25 hours uh, in the two-year period where you can lay your own focus. Again, this is intended for, for uh, uh, engineers to develop themselves in uh, a broad way. Um, on the practical side, we have developed um, an, the online professional development tool, um, which serves um, uh, a number of purposes. Uh, it facilitates the initial professional development uh, uh, stage, both in general and also towards chartership. So um, even for uh, uh, engineers uh, who do not immediately want to uh, qualify as a chartered engineer, um, they can use this because it, it is a planning tool um, and uh, a, a strategy tool that helps you think in terms of the competences and in terms of the, of the, of, of the reflective learning, in terms of building your portfolio and so you already get a more focused way of uh, going about your professional uh, development. Um, but of course, it's also integrated with the chartership process at all stages and facilitates us uh, and actually also the user in monitoring the CPD requirements because you can put it in, it will count it up for you immediately um, and show you whether or not you have already uh, reached the re your requirement uh, for CPD and it will help us in checking if uh, 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 engineers have reached their CPD requirements, and if not, you can lose the chartered or incorporated engineer title. 
Um, here are just a few snapshots. Um, um, the top one is, is the general one that shows how you can uh, uh, make a, your, your, uh, your own personal strategic plan also look. So how does that compare to your company strategic plan? What are you developing towards? What do you need to do uh, um, to get there? And uh, how does it relate to the various competencies that you're trying to develop? Um, and uh, the middle one is um, uh, typically the dashboard you will have when you are uh, in the process of uh, attaining chartership or professional registration, uh, which is the same, um, and helps you, helps you monitor where you're at um, and write it all down, get, create your portfolio. And uh, the bottom one is the one after you have uh, attained your professional registration um, and you want to maintain CPD. Again, it helps you to um, keep track of it and uh, uh, helps you count. Um, this is just a brief uh, summary again um, uh, of what the OPD tool does to uh, um, that it's suitable for all career stages and that it offers a very flexible structure and it also helps you to make reports. So um, uh, you, you can also use it with your, uh, uh, in your job situation uh, with your employer or with your employees or with your, uh, um, uh, even when, you, when, you, when you're looking for a new job because it can create your CV and your portfolio very easily. Um, and we've combined that into an online chartership platform um, uh, which just has everything, uh, the tool, the register, uh, uh, CPD opportunities um, uh, in which you can also see the universities who are especially developing uh, courses um, for the uh, CPD for engineers. Um, and also the academic panel that we have, uh, which is also uh, um, uh, part of, our, of, of the system of assessing uh, candidates. Um, and I'm starting to come to a conclusion. Um, um, what we find important is that we have a close cooperation uh, and agreement with industry. Um, and uh, they find um, this structure and especially supported by this tool very useful because it helps to stimulate uh, 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 and align the professional development strategy and planning for uh, uh, their engineers. And actually what we've also come to see is um, that we are able to offer HR support uh, to the companies and advise them on how to improve the development of their engineers um, because we get to see a lot of that now through um, the, the processes that, the, uh, that they're doing. Um, uh, so I think that was also one of the very uh, uh, important takeaways that we have from using this uh, uh, professional registration uh, structure. Um, this is just um, uh, an outline uh, for uh, uh, the things that we do with, uh, uh, with industry and obviously it almost can't be read. We just thought it was a very cool uh, figure. <laughs> Here is um, uh, uh, just an, 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 an excerpt of the various organizations that we are, that we are working with. Um, it's not all of them, and you may also not know all of them, and you may know some of them, but the idea is that you can, I hope you can take away from it, is that all the various stakeholders uh, in the work of engineers, um, th their companies, um, the universities, um, the research institutions, um, uh, big and small industry, um, they are all sort of joined together in this professional registration structure um, and finding their place in it. And that is what excites us in the Netherlands. And that was it, thank you very much. Bueno, muchas gracias, Micaela. De tu presentación me quedo con una cosa que has dicho al principio, que lo que tenemos en común, y digo, lo que tenemos en común es mucho, creo que tenemos un recorrido todos juntos en el tema de la certificación profesional. 
No hemos agotado todo el tiempo absolutamente. Tenemos que desmontar esta mesa para montar la siguiente. Muchas gracias a todos, muchas gracias a todos los ponentes. Hasta, hasta la próxima.